will notify you once you begin. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, The ABCs of Utility Scale Inverters, brought to you by Solar Power World Magazine and our sponsors, Advanced Energy and TMEIC. We would like to thank Kent Bro of AETI and Zach Ward from Advanced Energy for giving us their time and insights into this growing and important topic. I'm Frank Andorka, Editorial Director of Solar Power World, and I'll be your moderator today. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. If you wish to tweet about this webinar anytime during or after, you can use the hashtag uh, SolarWebinar. We love social media and we hope you do too. In fact, you can follow us at, at SolarPowerWorld, that's without the O, or me at SolarFrankA. We will have a Q&A session after the presentations. Go ahead and submit your questions and we will ask them after all the presenters are finished with their presentations. Questions can be asked using the GoToWebinar on your screen. Our first presenter is Kent Bro, the Global Director of Renewable Markets at AETI. He is responsible for all sales and marketing activities for AETI's complete set of utility scale inverters and services. The second presenter is Zach Ward, Director of Utility Sales and Business Development, North America at Advanced Energy. And he oversees all sales and marketing efforts around AE's North American large scale solar projects. He's been with AE for more than 10 years where he helped launch AE's solar inverter business and achieve its largest market share in four years. Presenters will be available to answer questions after the presentation. And without further ado, I will hand the mic over to Kent Bro. Kent? First off, I'd love to thank uh, Frank and, and Solar Power World for putting on this event. So thanks, guys, for including us, and as well as to my co-presenter, Zach. Um, this is a very interesting topic. Um, certainly, as we go about talking to customers and, and utilities, we, we often get a lot, uh, asked a lot of these questions. So I'm happy to present here. Um, you know, first off, the word inverters is a, is a very broad term. It could be, you know, as, as the narrowest of sense could be, just the power electronics of the system. Uh, in the broadest of sense, it's basically a, a total unit uh, with transformers and switch gear and disconnect switches and all all components that are that are there. So first off, you know, when when AETI is speaking or when we're speaking about it, we're talking about the whole unit that's required basically to take the power off of the panel to the grid. And when we're talking about uh, the, these products with customers, most often folks think of these things as the weak link in the in the whole uh, so an e ecosystem that, that it takes to bring a utility scale form up. And it's a real daunting purchase for customers because the, because of just the simply the, the features and, and uh, components that are actually included in that whole train. Uh, it's really the only thing that in the, uh, in the ecosystem that has you know, moving parts, has lots of software and PLCs, has both inward features that are designed to, to face towards the, the, solar, uh, the solar panels as well as outward features that are designed to help interconnect to the utility and, and handle uh, features and functionality that's needed for that. Um, so it's not a it's not a comp uh, uncomplex topic, and we'll try to cover that here in you know 15 to 20 minutes. If after the call there's any further questions that you'd like to elaborate or anything, I've got my contact information here on the on, on the slide, and we can certainly do that uh, at the end of the call or or later on. Um, so when we sit down and talk with people and they ask us, you know, what are the sort of the key attributes they should they should be thinking about when they're looking at the, you know, the the landscape of all the products that are out there, we really try to boil it down into three key elements. Um, the keys that that we uh, talk about typically are really about efficiency of the of the whole system, but we'll focus on the inverter here today. Um, you know, what is the supplier and the product liability, and looking at things from an, an entire installation cost perspective. So really calculating those costs and using the inverter as one component of those. Um, and how does that help you? How does the inverter help you drive that down? <clears throat> um, specifically around equipment efficiency, you know, the first thing that people always look at is the data sheet. And the data sheet, uh, if someone is a war of data sheets among the vendors, and that's usually where we put our best and brightest uh, types of uh, statistics. So. We always recommend that customers really look at the efficiency of the unit in terms of uh, CEC weighted average, uh, and there's a real good reason for that. If you see uh, data sheets or companies that are making claims or inverters are making claims of extremely high efficiencies, that typically means they're using a single data point, okay? 
Um, and CEC is a weighted average, which allows you to see the efficiencies across the entire production curve. So when, you, when you're looking at it, you want to look at um, how your entire production curve would actually be, uh, would be, would be producing energy on the, on the field so that your output numbers that you'll get in production, i.e. how much money the farm will make, will actually be reliable across the entire production, farm, uh, um, uh, entire production curve. So please make sure you, you do that. The, the second place that we look at efficiency is really trying to encourage customers to look at PV panels specifically, which obviously tie to the inverters that are either a thousand volts or frankly greater in, uh, in capabilities. So this is where um, the most efficiency is actually gotten out of the farm. You can get the most energy production by really pushing the capabilities of the panels and the inverters to handle, you know, to, to utilize the capabilities above a thousand volts. Um, you know, in, in general terms, you know, a thousand volts, you know, the higher the voltage, the less the loss, the less the loss, the higher the, the efficiencies, right? It also lets you use different types of cable, uh, lower cost cable. There's a number of different reasons why you want to look at that. And it all really boils down to that greater, a thousand volt or greater uh, PV panels as well as inverters will, will have higher efficiency and less loss in the, in the field, which isn't necessarily always accounted for in the, uh, or isn't accounted for in the CEC weighted average. So definitely want to push customers through that and to use the, the latest and greatest technology along those lines. And then finally is, you know, stringing um, those that greater than 1,000 volt PV panels, we believe that companies should look at unipolar configurations for the inverters. Um, and that's a pretty simple reason. It's just less, less hassle to construct. Um, we've gotten numbers anywhere from, you know, 10 to 15 percent savings in, term of, in terms of the total construction of the farm by using unipolar construction. Cuts out, you know, some of the wiring that needs to happen. It's just a simpler insulation model for our customers. So on the efficiency side, just in summary, you know, definitely look into the efficiency numbers of the, uh, of the inverter and make sure that uh, there's something to back up the claims. Push the PV panels uh, either through stringing them up uh, in you know high numbers of, of panels or just in in the capabilities of the panel itself to, you know greater than a thousand volts uh, and string to as high voltage as you can via unipolar because it's going to get the most efficiency out of the farm and uh, unipolar construction is going to allow you to to cut down on the construction cost so that's uh, sort of the efficiency side of what we look at the other things that we look at is is really reliability, and and we look at reliability um, in a number of different ways. The again back to my first comments, where when we talk to customers, there's a lot of fear and certainly doubt in this particular product line. There's a lot of stories or product piece of the, the portfolio that you need to deploy. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are a lot of stories of you know inverter failures and you know not meeting capabilities and and companies not holding up the warranties, whatever. And, and certainly as a vendor in the market, uh, we want to make sure that, you know, the whole market uh, can, you know, does a better job at that because certainly we want to hold up our end of the bargain. And we typically tell customers to look at the, first off, look at the product evolution of these, of the inverter. Uh, very few companies built an inverter from, a utility scale, scale inverter from scratch. There are some nessus to that product line or something that they were doing beforehand, whether that be, you know, they were on the commercial or residential side or small scale inverters and then beef that up, or maybe they were coming from you know, using, uh, building multi-megawatt drive systems or other power generation sources such as, you know, generators and, and wind and, and other, other places. And you know, we believe that um, those, the, where the products come from and they evolve, uh, help uh, have the vendors create certain design decisions. And they've got to live with certain decisions that they made uh, when they were building the previous product line and they add on and eventually put this into a utility scale farm. So our, our encourage, what we encourage customers to do is really look towards products that evolve from some aspect of multi-megawatt power distribution and conversion. Because, and specifically in the utility scales, uh, in the utility market are dealing with utilities. So all grid tie type activities. Because what that helps is to ensure that this product evolved from a place where you need it to be, and not from a place where maybe there's you know uh, residual feature functionality and or design choices that really don't fit a utility scale uh, platform and have features and functionality that utilities actually want. So really dig into how this product was made. 
The other piece that we look at, and, and this sort of ties to the product evolution side, which is, which is look at environmentals. If you look at where um, you hear the stories from yourself or you know, friends in the industry or you read online or whatever it may be, where a lot of the products have had, had issues is really uh, not that the products themselves don't work. Okay, I, I will say that um, the market in general, if you go to any number of inverter companies, they can provide you a product that converts you know, DC power into AC and typically will do what it says on the tent. Um, it's when you get these products out into the real world and you put them in very harsh conditions, which you know, inherently if you're gonna put a solar farm, it's probably not gonna be in the, you know, the, the, the nicest of areas in terms of environmental, right? It's certainly not gonna be in a, uh, uh, in a, temp in a, uh, in a mild climate. So it's going to be somewhere hot, somewhere where there's a lot of irradiance, uh, typically dusty, dirty, out in the middle of the field. Uh, you know, you've all, hopefully you've actually had a chance to visit one of these places because you, you realize it's not an easy place to survive for inverters nor humans. So um, we, we, we sort of point customers to a couple, couple key things to, to avoid or to look at on these products. First off, Always avoid products that have ground level intakes for the air. And this, whether whether there be uh, air cooled units or they are using air for radiators for liquid cooling or some other reason. Anything ground level is gonna introduce a lot more sand, dirt, grime, dust. And those from you know bearings and fans and just the overall electronics of the system are not healthy for the system. Some of that stuff is conductive in nature. Uh, and you wanna look at that when you're looking at the, the, uh, the soil samples. So, if you look at the way dust typically flows, it will be sort of eight feet down. So you want rooftop intakes on the air. You want that air filtered in a very detailed way. And you want to make sure whatever's uh, introduced into, uh, into the, uh, the environment or into the, uh, um, into the inside of the cabinet is always uh, very, very clean. Things like uh, cabinet pressurization and other techniques, gasketing, other techniques to keep that out as well is something you should you should also look at. So uh, dirt is not our friend. The other piece is um, the, the moving parts on the system usually revolve around fans and pumps as well as the power electronics itself. You can call that a moving part because it's got you know, it has powers and, and, and component electronics. Um, the, we key on the fans because um, when we did our research, we, we did a lot of uh, you know, vendor interaction with folks that basically build fans and maintain fans all day, and that's all they do. And, and what we got back resoundingly was small, uh, low, uh, low velocity fans uh, last much longer and are more reliable than large fans in the systems. So if you're gonna have cooling systems, look at the size of the fans. Think about how much air they have to move in and out. Uh, so we prefer, and we always, this is what we use, and we tell customers to look at the design aspect of it. A large number of lower speed, smaller fans will last longer, uh, just in general, in terms of meal to mean time before failure. Uh, the other piece is um, they also give you a level of redundancy. If you get one fan that goes out and you have a one or two large fans in the system versus a large number of lower speed fans, the system will still operate, though it may be at some derating on the high end of the temperature curve. So um, that's another aspect to look at um, is you know making sure that those fans are are appropriate for the design. And then finally, uh, we're a big believer in, in liquid cooling for these units, and for a number of different reasons. You know, just the general thermodynamics of, of water versus air. You know, water controls heat 30 times better than air. Uh, it takes four times as much heat to increase an equivalent temperature than the same amount of air. Uh, so all of our units are, are, are liquid cooled uh, and sometimes you know you may not be in the excessive temperatures, but we still believe that's the way to go to keep the system running uh, to its maximum potential. And one of those reasons is, is that these power electronics and, and all of the power, uh, power transistors that are in the system work better at a constant temperature. So when things in the electronic side break, it's typically because of expansion and contraction. So if you can keep them cool better, but also keep them at a constant temperature, uh, then that's much better, much better for the longevity of the system. So um, those are a couple things on the environmental side that you know you want to make sure that you look at, again, in summary, in air intakes, fans, and the design of those fans, and then you know, really take a hard look at liquid cooled systems as an option. Uh, finally, you know, look at the rest of the uh, the components in the system and, and try to get control power com uh, components that are 
our control components that are, you know, at least 65 to 70 degrees C rated, because that's another place where you'll see a lot of heat uh, failures is just in the you know, general management of the system. Uh, finally, on uh, the evaluate reliability, look at financial reliability of of the companies that you're dealing with, um, and you know th that is because you want a long-term relationship with these customers. And this is a very tough market for everybody involved. There's obviously been a huge, huge uh, price crunch on the panel side, inverters, components, EPC services, and really everybody is trying to do their part to reach uh, grid parity. So, you know, the idea of bankability lots of times goes to how many have you installed, and that's certainly a, uh, a relevant question in terms of experience in, uh, in, in doing these multi-megawatt plants and, and you doing grid-tied ap applications. But, you know, I would expand that, uh, probably go more towards the side of financial viability, not only experience of the, of the people that you're partnering with, because, you know, there is definitely, you know, well-publicized cases of, people going out of business in the solar industry, and there certainly will be more. Uh, there's also a lot more that haven't been publicized. So we encourage customers to obviously look at financial viability, look at if they're a standalone solar company and they're relying on that market to, to keep the company afloat, or if, you know, preferably look at companies that have a broader range of products and markets, but also have the solar expertise because as this market continues to push down, and, and really squeeze the ecosystem for, for every drop of, of margin, uh, it's very, very difficult to be a standalone company. So uh, definitely take a look at that and got a company with a mix just like a, any good energy company that, you know, they got a mix of coal and natural gas and, and all kind of different assets. Having that mix of, of businesses from a products perspective allows companies to invest and do more R&D and, and really help, uh, you know, again, as we drive towards grid parity. Um, Finally, on the installation cost side, we, you know, we really um, get a lot of questions from our customers, or when we're doing bids or projects, or really looking at, uh, you know, how do we, or how do people want us to articulate the value of our systems? Um, we always get how many, you know, how many dollars per watt is your system, and and that's a, that's basically a capital expenditure type metric. Um, and, and we like to encourage people or really talk about things in terms of watts per dollar, right? So that ties back to greater efficiency, greater reliability. You know, what's the long-term uh, ROI for the system? How does the inverter help you achieve that? How does it help you achieve more money? Which these in the utility scale industry are all going to be a for-profit type, type endeavor. So we believe that it should everything should be considered as a single inversion station. So. And, we'll, and the reason why we recommend that and, and why we develop the products to this is that a couple of different things. One is you want a single system that has uh, optimized parts that have been tested together. And I'll get to the testing part of that a little bit later as, as the last bullet point. But you want to make sure that all these components, you know, go together. They're uh, produced in that manner time and time again. The relationships between the vendors uh, are all solid. Uh, and most importantly, that ensures more reliability and more test time and, and, and more sort of soak time on that system. But it also gives you the ability to basically get warranties and service that really are sort of down to the, you know, down to the bolts on the outside of the door. So um, we, we, as a general rule, make all of our products. We make them here in the U.S. We make them in Beaumont, Texas, and we own and, and manufacture all those components so when people buy from us, We've had, you know, obviously we buy components from people that go into the system. But from a system level perspective, we we sell a single inversion station and we own all warranties and everything that go along with that. And all components pre-integrated and tested, um, you know, it should it should arrive to you and make sure that you ask these questions. Really, pre not only pre-tested but pre-tested to your configuration. So as you're dealing with utilities and you're dealing with different panels and different configurations. The software may or may not change, uh, and the way that the system behaves may or may not change based on your deployment. So instead of doing those things in the field, uh, we like to recommend people, you know, create, work with the vendors, create your software releases, create your configurations, test to those in the factory uh, to the best of the ability that you can. When you get it to the field, theoretically, obviously nothing's always theoretically 100% correct. There, there's bound to be something that you got to do, but. But less issues and less configuration in the field just makes things go faster and easier and smoother. So we like to test our products with clients' configuration, make sure that we deliver to them, 
and uh, and you know they basically have to connect DC in, AC out, and you know we're, we're turning up the system commissioning and fine tuning at that point. Um, and then finally, you know we believe that um, this is a very competitive industry. Uh, I don't know what the exact number is now, but if you look at the you know last year I went to SPI and I think there was probably a, a hundred inverter manufacturers of some you know some type. Not all of them were utility scale. It's a much smaller number, but there are tons and tons of companies that make these products. Certainly, more and more every day are coming in from overseas, and you know it's very hard for a consumer to make decisions based off of you know all the marketing hype that's out there and, and webinars like this and, and other things. And, and we believe that in the spirit of utility scale and and how utilities might do it, they would demand that these products are are really tested. Uh, to a certain specification, either 1741 or UL, UL um, or IEEE 1547, whatever it is, LBRT, uh, 661, whatever those things that are important to you, make sure the manufacturer is able to give you a third-party report that basically says we tested it. We're you know UL, we're TUV, we're Intertech. These are the tests that we ran. This is the data set and how we did it. This is the data set that it generated, and there's a stamp on that document. That it will guarantee you that you know the the products in that test did what it said on the tin, and that will ensure that uh, that you're getting a product that this isn't you know maybe overmarketed, and, and and I fear that that may be the case in in some instances in the industry. Um, so in summary, um, from an AETI perspective, we want our customers to focus on equipment efficiency. We want them to uh, by driving um, the wattage on the on the panels and stringing to to higher um, um, high voltages as well. Really look at a reliability of the system, where it came from, how it uh, how it's built, and you know what's the long-term relationship with the customer, uh, with the vendor and the customer, and to really look at that dollars per watt uh, paradigm and look at insulation costs holistically versus just the cost of the inverters itself, because you may be missing out on some dollars on the back end that you may be able to recoup in terms of revenue. So again, I want to thank Solar Power World and, and Frank for having us, and I'll turn it over to my uh, uh, my, the other presenter, uh, Zach. Thanks, Kent. Uh, we really appreciate your thoughts and insights there. And uh, next up is Zach Ward of Advanced Energy. Zach? Thank you, Frank, for the introduction and for organizing this uh, great event. Uh, we appreciate that. And thanks, Kent, for the informative uh, presentation. Um, what I'd like to do is cover some of the key factors in selecting a utility inverter, uh, looking more from the project in instead of the product um, out uh, to give you some other perspective in, in, in your evaluation of projects and inverter suppliers. Um, and try to cover a little bit of the LCOE aspects of our projects and um, and how the, the different inverter features and, and aspects of the inverters can affect those economics. Uh, these are pretty complex topics, um, but I'll certainly try to boil them down to some basics uh, that I think uh, might be useful for anyone looking at utility scale projects. Apologize for that. My uh, my internet uh, connection must be slow, and I'm having trouble controlling the slides. So I guess the the first question uh, is really, what is utility scale solar? Um, that definition is a pretty broad uh, description. Um, what we find is that um, any typically ground mount system that's directed directly connected to a utility is somewhat considered a utility project. Those can range from one to two megawatt projects all the way up to 300 megawatt projects. Um, the size of the project can be deceiving. Some of the smaller projects can be just as complicated um, as the mega projects, as the 50, 100, 200 megawatt projects. So it's important to know um, all the stakeholders and the general ecosystem of the project. Um, that includes the interconnection, um, the jurisdiction, the off takers, the ownership, the financing partners, understand all the aspects of, of the project so you have a clear 
understanding of the requirements. Um, these requirements, uh, once you boil them down, can greatly influence uh, the supplier and the inverter model that you choose from that supplier. Um, and a big driver of that uh, when it comes to the inverters is the utility-enabled features, how it interacts with the grid. The key factors um, uh, that I have found in selecting uh, a utility-scale inverter really come down to supplier qualification, technical requirements, and performance. Supplier qualification can be uh, an in-depth process, um, as, as Kent described, uh, to make sure that, that you have the right partner uh, before entering into the project. Uh, bankability is always uh, the first and foremost uh, feature or uh, aspect that people look into. The financial strength of the company, uh, the balance sheet, uh, the diver diversification of the company uh, for its longevity and, and also for its its uh, ability uh, for the financing of the project. Um, all partners in the in the project need to be bankable in order to uh, get the right credit rating and to make sure the project is financing gets um, gets off without any hitches. The other aspects really go into um, the you know the pre-execution work and the execution work and the post-execution work. Um, pre project, uh, there's a lot of application support that is really required in uh, designing the most optimized system, uh, understanding the harvest models, understanding the efficiency of the inverter, uh, the, the behaviors of the inverter, the ratings of the inverter, so that you properly harvest, uh, so you properly model the harvest um, for the site. Once you get into project ex execution, um, it, it does require a, a project management, understanding the logistics to make sure all the parts arrive on time and work in order, pre-tested, make sure that all the documentation is in order, make sure that execution goes smoothly. As we've gone from you know one to 10 megawatt projects now to multi-hundred megawatt projects, uh, the timelines have shrunk dramatically. Uh, these projects are being executed uh, faster and faster every month. Uh, some of the other things to look at in supplier qualification are production, how much volume uh, can the supplier supply, um, what is the demand that they have with their existing customer base, um, and make sure that they can execute uh, to the delivery schedule that's required for the project. I think experience is, uh, you know, is the best ed education. Um, Understanding the ins and outs of utility jobs is, is, is critical in selecting a partner. Uh, making sure that they have the processes, whether they be um, uh, supplier type processes or they have site processes, safety processes, uh, so they can be an effective partner once they get to the job site. It's important also to know their infrastructure, where their offices are, their supply depots, uh, if they have the capabilities and the knowledge base um, to handle the submittal requirements for permitting, uh, PE stamps um, with, with local jurisdictions, uh, contractor licensing, insurance requirements, uh, things like that. <clears throat> um, after the site is, is constructed, um, it is pretty important to understand what the cost of ownership of the inverters are, or the, uh, if you will, the, the whole inverter solution including the transformers to switch gear. Um, that affects the, also affects the LCOE of the site and um, what is going to be the annual budget and what are those requirements over the life cycle of the project. The, the last uh, part is really understanding uh, what I think Kent described a lot about was really understanding the cost for the total solution. Uh, there are many inverter technologies out there. There are many uh, switch gear suppliers. There's lots of transformer suppliers really understanding what are all those pieces and how they fit together and what is the cost for those to be delivered to the site to meet your job requirements. Um, <clears throat> some, of the, some of the major points um, uh, that happen in the industry is really the indoor versus outdoor inverter models, uh, whether they require uh, ancillary cooling systems, um, shelters, 
uh, what are the costs are for those systems, not only in capital expenditure, expenditures, but also in long-term O&M costs. Um, that can be a big factor in your, um, in your harvest and your capital expenditures. The next key factor is really the technical requirements of the project. And this really uh, typically narrows down the candidates uh, that you can, you can find uh, that can meet the project requirements. And um, the biggest one is really understanding the utility behavior. Is it a DG or a transmission interconnection? Uh, uh, what are the jurisdictions and the behaviors that are going to be expected from the inverter supplier? Whether they be California Rule 21, whether they be UL 1741, whether there be a, a version of LVRT, and there's multiple versions of them out there, or could it be a custom behavior? Uh, many of the islands like Hawaii, Puerto Rico, um, can require some very specific behaviors um, that are very important to understand uh, before you select the inverter model. The power envelope is also very important. Uh, the KDA rating of the unit, uh, what the temperature profiles look like, and what are the power factor ranges of the unit. Uh, most projects, utility scale projects today, uh, of the larger size uh, require some sort of reactive power requirement. And it's important to understand um, how you can meet those needs while producing the full nameplate power so that it doesn't affect the economics of the project or the, um, or the, the long-term return. Um, it's also important to identify uh, the AHJ, um, uh, whether they're comfortable with 600 volt designs or 1,000 volt designs. Uh, any C and UL compliance um, and understand who the authorities are and what uh, latitudes the, uh, the EPC or the developer is going to have with the project. I think uh, this is less common, but it can still be um, a pitfall in the project is really understanding the city, state, and federal requirements. Um, from the environmental, uh, solar plants are, are very friendly when it comes to the environment, um, but it is important to know for fluids, especially transformer fluids and, and, and any chemicals that are on, on the site or within the system, and also noise emissions. Uh, many jurisdictions have pretty strict regulations on noise emissions, um, uh, audible and also um, uh, <clears throat> audible and, and also uh, um, from uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation. Um, it's also important to understand uh, what the uh, conditions are at the project site, whether they be extreme conditions with, um, with uh, corrosive materials like salt, whether they be dust, whether it be heavy snow loads at the site, whether the sites have extreme hot temperatures, extreme cold temperatures. It's important to understand that when you're picking uh, the inverter solution to make sure that it can perform in all of the environmental aspects of the project. Uh, from the last part of the requirements, um, which I still consider somewhat of environmental, is uh, is there any security requirement, whether there be localized security or whether there be uh, NERC type of compliance on your IT infrastructure and your plant control system. Uh, the last uh, a key factor in evaluating your inverter supply uh, decisions are really performance. This is where the rubber hits the highway. Um, really understand what the optimal de array design is, uh, what's going to be the most cost effective and the, the most amount of harvest you can achieve, uh, whether that be a one megawatt block size, design size or a one and a half or a two or two and a half megawatt project size. Um, that's pretty important to understanding which suppliers can supply you inverter stations that are capable of those sizes. Um, those sizes can range dramatically depending on um, if you're doing fixed tilt or tracker arrangement, what your land, land usage is going to look like, um, the, uh, the general layout or plot of the land or usable space within that plot, um, and it's always a trade-off between um, ground coverage, DC cabling, and the number of inverter stations that you'll have to purchase and install. 
Um, it's important to model all the losses in the system to really understand uh, what that megawatt hour versus cost per watt is in the end solution. I think another element of performance is um, is under the um, you know the performance uh, with regards to the contract uh, is to understand from the supply base who is going to give you the capabilities of of performance uh, whether it be efficiency uh, whether it be uptime reliability type of guarantees in your contract um, how they can handle the liquidated damages for deliveries and execution um, and how uh, if there's any uh, requirements for uh, general liabilities and, and, and bonding. <clears throat> and then uh, my last point is really project experience. Um, at the end of the day, everyone has to execute their piece of the project uh, for the project to be successful and for all the people involved to be successful, from the financier to the equipment suppliers. <clears throat> the selection on, on your inverter choice has a big impact on that. It is truly the heart and the brain of the system. Um, and that's a critical decision uh, that you need to make. I think that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Zach, for that informative presentation. And we will now, in fact, uh, open it up to questions. <clears throat> and I will go ahead and ask them. Um, fortunately, uh, we had a, a very active uh, group of, of attendees. So um, let me start off by asking the first question. Um, from Steve, can these inverters shift power factor in response to grid needs? I think that goes to both of you. I Certainly. Um, uh, you have a dynamic response. Uh, you can have a scheduled response or, or dispatch. Um, and you can have um, you know, an active control, which would be more of a, a manual dispatch, if you will. So you can, um, most inverters out there, including the advanced energy inverters, have the capabilities of both generative um, and consumptive reactive power um, at the point of interconnect. And um, same thing for the ATI inverter. We go from uh, 0.05 power factor to 0.95 power factor with the same set of features that he was discussing. Kent, this one's directed at you. Um, you were talking about water-cooled inverters, and out in the desert southwest, it seems unlikely that water would be available for large PV fields. Sinking well and putting in water cleanup seems pretty expensive and complicated. Could you elaborate on which, how you would get the water to water-cool your inverters uh, in a situation uh, like the one that Mark discussed? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the system, it's just like your car. It's a closed radiator system. It doesn't require free-flowing uh, free water. So there's a, a water tank, uh, usually either in the in hot, in hot uh, areas where you don't have to worry about freezing, it would just be pure uh, ionized water, or deionized water. And then uh, if it's a you know climate where you could get past freezing, you'd put a little glycol in it, depending on the temperature range. So really the reality of it is just like your car, when you drive it in the desert, your radiator doesn't you know, it doesn't run out of water, right? Uh, you check it once a year. Uh, it might need a little fill up. You know, every now and again, there's a, they're both in, it's instrumented as well uh, via PLC, so that you know you can actually have that reported back to you and say, hey, this one's, you know, below water line. There's a visible um, uh, when you open the box. There's a visible me uh, measurement area where it tells you how full it is. So, from a maintenance perspective, it's it's a closed system. It's just like your car. Uh, but the you know the benefits of it are simply the thermodynamics of water being much much better for higher temperatures and consistent temperatures. So hope that answers your question. Um, to both of you, what is the most common hurdle in utility scale inverter implementation on average? From David. Um, uh, this is Zach from Advanced Energy. I, I would say that the biggest hurdle that we see is really understanding the local jurisdictions um, and their requirements. Um, a lot of times the interconnection requirements can be in conflict with what the listing standards are and you have to uh, deal with uh, local county uh, authorities as well as the um, maybe federal agency 
or a regional agency that's the grid operator and uh, these requirements don't always line up on top of each other and so you have to navigate uh, the various stakeholders to make sure that they're all comfortable uh, with uh, how the plant will operate. Yeah, I'd agree with that as well. I mean, you can also turn that internally to the farm, right? Um, is really, you know, from a manufacturing perspective and a, and, a, and, a, and a vendor perspective, we have to be able to make changes to the system to meet those changing requirements, whether it be, you know, utility interconnect um, um, requirements or even, you know, adding a, a couple of, uh, of uh, you know, combiner connections so that you can, you know, because the number of panels change, I mean, this, these things evolve really almost to the last minute. So it's a challenge from a vendor's perspective to make sure that we deliver the right product, pre-tested, pre-qualified against exact um, specifications, and that's why I also recommend that that be part of your purchase process because, you know, as those things change, once it gets set, you're going to want to make sure that you're, you know, able to really you know, blow and go with these things. So very similar. It's just I think it's holistically uh, is narrowing things that narrowing things down to a fixed. Uh, a fixed configuration that everybody agrees on, including AHJs and you know, your customers and DPCs and everybody else, so that we can we can manufacture and deliver them. Uh, from Steve, uh, since transformers are the next component in the installation, can you address impedance matching of parallel inverters and transformers? Well, what we typically do on our side is we do, you know, back to that bundled um, bundled scenario. You know, we basically would ask the customer, um, we can we can do with or without transformers. We typically sell them with transformers because it is much simpler. Um, we have a, a suite of, of transformers that we we take supply from. In our instance, we use GE Prolic transformers that we we skid mount with our system. Make sure all of that matches up. Make sure they're they're one percent efficient so they don't. Uh, are 99% uh, efficient so that they uh, you know don't uh, cause too much in terms of power that they actually uh, lose in the in the step up um, and then outside of that um, we would look at the you know transformer selection and making sure we had the right transformer would really boil down to the grounding requirements of the of the utility typically or whomever we're connecting to uh, and that sometimes is a complex process that we've got to go through uh, calls directly with the utility and make sure our technical folks really understand what they're looking to do. Yeah, at, at Advance Energy, um, some of the same, uh, we echo some of the same uh, comments from Ken. Um, we do have the advantage of being um, a truly transformerless platform, uh, so it doesn't require the, the presence of that uh, transformer for any of the um, inherent filtering or operation of the inverter, so they're, uh, they are uh, um, anonymous to one another. Um, but it is important um, in your transformer selection to understand if what the requirements are from the utility, um, what is going to be the winding configuration, um, if there's, uh, you know, and there's an economic decision there too with inverter, uh, sorry, transformer efficiency. Um, Typically, with transformers, the more you pay, the, the better they get. And uh, what what is that threshold, and uh, what makes the most sense uh, from the project capex standpoint and long-term performance over the life of the plant? I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. One from Kleber, who asks, "Can you have a UL1741 listing and meet the FERC ERCOT LVRT requirements?" Uh, and then somebody asked, uh, Joe asked, are the AETI 1000 volt inverters UL1741 marked? All right, I'll take the AETI specific question. Um, the, um, there is no UL mark for 1000 volt. It, it, it's pretty much end at um, 600 volt, and that's why the witness test is, uh, is so important. So um, you can take the same standards, UL1741, 2010, have TUV, UL, Intertech come in, perform all those same all those same tests, uh, and provide you a report. And that's essentially what we did many, many uh, months ago on our products. Actually, when we first introdu introduced it, so that becomes the um, 
the information that you would give uh, an inspector or, or whomever else that needs to understand, you know, what um, uh, what standards this, the system was was built against and, and how it meets those standards. So, again, just to simplify, it, no, there is no sticker for that at this point in time. We push for it, but they don't they don't uh, they haven't actually put a sticker from a UL perspective. But you can get those systems witness tested, and those witness tests are accepted by uh, by inspectors and AHJs as uh, proof of uh, the standards and, and your adherence to them. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo some of the same comments from, from Kent that um, you hit it on a soft subject right now where the listing standards really haven't caught up to the practical projects that we're doing um, as part, as, as a large part of the UL 1741 standard is the IEEE 1547, which is anti-irony, which is the opposite of low voltage ride through. Uh, therefore, you, you, you cannot have a true listing um, if you do have a low voltage ride through requirement. However, if you do have anti ioning requirements and, and standard interaction, um, you know, you can achieve um, different levels of, of uh, attestation or witness testing or certified reports from the various NRTLs. Uh, Leonard has a couple of questions for you. He says, please address the inverter fault current issues, fault contribution under active inverter control, and please address the harmonics and resonance issues. Wow, well, Zach, I might let you have that one, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken. That might be a little um, out of my engineering pay grade. Yeah, I, I think that's a complex uh, question uh, that you know might be better done. Um, uh, outside the, the the format that we're at, more of a one-on-one -on -one or, or smaller group discussion. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm happy to bring one of our engineers on for for that kind of question. That's a that's a really uh, very very engineering focused question that you know I wouldn't I wouldn't do justice to. Very good. Um, is uh, uh, from uh, Arthur. Is OEM technical service required, or can project techs work on the system? MTBF for systems. Well, from our perspective, um, our warranty and, and, and agreements are all uh, it, it really pretty simple. Um, you know, we can either do uh, O&M on the system in terms of a brand of maintenance agreement, and we can help customers out that way. If they have um, qualified people that they want to have trained in our systems, then we will train them, uh, usually during the commissioning phase, to operate it. Um, and, and we'll still warrant that as long as they get training and understand how to use the system. We have a hotline they can call and get advice. We have a, uh, you know, and, and, and that ties to sort of mean time before failure. You know, if you're looking at a, a complex system like an inverter, um, you know, you, you really got to break it down. There's consumables and non-consumables in there, how long those last, and uh, versus, you know, the other components. And um, based on the fact that we've been using a lot of these same components for 20 years, not necessarily in utility scale solar, um, ATI has a, a very, very good idea of how long the different components will last. We give our customers a, a schedule of those parts. We have a spare parts program that we can we can put spare parts on site, and then we either we'll either do it and as part of our preventive maintenance agreement, where we'll go out and service those components in the expected life uh, lifetime, or we'll uh, we'll give you that and and your service people, and and you can do that as well. So. We, we try to be flexible because some people want the help and other people want to other people want to do it themselves. I think that brings up a key point though, and that goes back to the you know where does this product come from and what is the lifespan that you've been working with, it, whether that be in or out of solar. Um, to you know, there's not a lot of people in the industry that have a, a you know a 20 year 20 years of experience with the majority of the components that are on their system, and we could offer that. Yeah, I would echo some of the same comments from Kent. Um, from an advanced energy standpoint, uh, the warranties um, are bumper to bumper. So during the warranty period, that would be an AE technician obviously servicing your units. Um, uh, you know, AE has been through extensive um, testing and reliability for the inverters, but also a lot of the products coming out of the industrial markets, uh, same as AE, AEIT, um, where we've been supplying um, industrial power conversion for about uh, just over 30 years. And um, so we have a, a strong understanding from uh, reliability, life test data, from field data, and from previous experience 
what the thresholds of the different components are, and those are all put into a preventive maintenance schedule. So you know every year, every every five years, every ten years, what components need to be swapped out. So you're proactively changing those components instead of suffering a failure and reactively repairing the unit. Um, when it comes to preventive maintenance, um, we do have uh, tr training programs and uh, certified, uh, uh, you know, service providers as well, um, in order to uh, in order to support those components. Going back to the water cooling for a minute, <clears throat> excuse me. Having closed loop, having a closed loop system is understood and can separate the heat source and cooling sections, which is advantageous. But providing maintenance uh, for the pumps and water cooling systems would be expensive and also risk associated uh, damage associated with water leakage and perhaps damage due to condensation. Uh, Ray asks, are there any strategies to accommodate these risk factors for utility scale installation? Yeah, so can you rerun the risks again? I got the last one. Let me jot them down, make sure I get them all. Uh, the, the risks were the um, damage by condensation and damage from a water leak. Okay, yeah, all of our, you know, in that case, um, the condensation and water leak are really covered by the same thing. So all of the, anything that, uh, the, the pumps are in a separate, in a, in a compartment in the system where they're isolated from the other components or anything that could, um, that could survive water dam or could, could have water damage. Any of the water piping is all double clad. So there's a, uh, it's, uh, it's basically a tubing that's then encased in PVC to basically, uh, capture all of the, any condensation or any water leakage that may happen. Uh, they're also in protected parts of the the uh, the structure. So, you know, the the idea of someone whacking it with uh, with a tool or something like that is minimized as well. So, we you know we've been doing these units for a long time, and that has never been an issue in terms of water leakage or condensation because of those factors. And in turn, in terms of the, if you look at the mean time before failure in a pump versus a uh, versus a fan, uh, typically those the pumps are much more reliable. And that's again back to the fact that they're not sucking in air. They don't have the, the bearings, and they're not exposed to the the uh, the, the uh, dust and grime and other things that would would cause those systems to wear out. So I think it's better on two two fronts. One is it is more reliable. Two, um, you know, it does last longer in terms of if you look at the components. Um, and then three. We have protective mechanisms to make sure that leakage doesn't affect the system or short anything out or you know affect the power electronics. It's all bottom fed into the power electronics and obviously those are designed to to be water cooled. We buy them as water cooled items as well. So um, so I, I don't think it's as big of an issue as uh, as it might be perceived. And we're happy to to show you the designs and the you know how we actually uh, handle that in in either pictures or live on the system. Yeah. I'd, I'd <clears throat> Again, um, you know, we're, we're, we're similar in a lot of our responses. Uh, the advanced energy cooling system is also uh, closed loop liquid cooling. Um, uh, similar to, to Kent's response, uh, we've been doing liquid cooling and power conversion components for a good part of 25 years. Um, if you look at most industrial markets, uh, they all use uh, liquid cooling because of its, um, uh, its better thermal uh, transfer capabilities than air especially in industrial environments when you have very harsh, high pollution level um, inside the factories or, or facilities that are installing it. So um, I, I wouldn't say that you could go out and design a system without any prior knowledge, but as long as you uh, have the experience in the field to design the system, um, it really becomes a, a strength of the system and not really a weakness. Uh, the advanced energy uh, liquid cooling system, there is no service required for 20 years with the system. The pump all the wetted surface, um, the heat exchanger, it all has a 20 year life. So, so it is essentially service free, if you will, um, similar to what uh, Kent described and it's a closed loop, it's not, um, it's not uh, exposed to ambient air. It's held under pressure and it's monitored at all times. So in the event um, that you would have a leak or any sort of um, uh, damage to the cooling system, it has all of the safe protections to um, to um, to prevent any damage uh, to the power components, um, and I, I think that about sums it up. All right, we've got time for two more questions. Uh, Carlos asks, "What is the expected lifetime of the inverter?" 
So uh, the, the design life that, that, that we have put into our inverter products is a 20 to 25 year design life. As long as the uh, maintenance, um, the preventive maintenance tasks are done, uh, you should have no problem getting that much life out of the inverter. Yeah, we have 25 year design life and uh, same thing. As long as the preventative maintenance and all of the scheduled maintenance tasks are done, you shouldn't have any issues. The last question. Is, comes from George. He says, what are the practical challenges while implementing low voltage ride through solutions from an inverter development standpoint and an implementation standpoint? The biggest thing that we see with low voltage ride through is getting the power curves from the utilities and exactly what they want. I mean, that's the, you know, the technology exists in, in, in these four quadrant inverters in, in order to do, um, to, to do the functionality. But the problem is, you know, uh, is really getting an understanding and the utility understanding exactly what they want you to do. Um, and all of them know they want it, all of them know they need it, um, but to, to really quantify that I found to be probably the biggest issue of implementation and it usually takes quite a bit of time to, uh, on both sides to, to make sure that's nailed down. Yeah, I, I think some of the biggest challenges we've seen is um, effectively testing low voltage ride through in your facility so that you can, once it gets to the field, uh, your customer and your utility is, is confident that the unit can perform as specified. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a complex, it's a bit of an engineering project that can be more complex than, than the inverter is to design these test fixtures and to effectively test it at full power. I think we'll, we just released a white paper on our website where um, one of the utilities has multiple inverter suppliers, and you can tell that a lot of the inverter suppliers have modeled it and tested the controls, but they haven't actually executed a full power test. And um, several of the inverter suppliers simply turned off in a, in a, in a stag event, um, and uh, the utility was uh, very open with those results and and how the um, inverters performed uh, real world, if you will. Um, and shared those results with the industry. So uh, please go to our website if you'd like to see more uh, more details about that white paper. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Zach. Uh, if you have any more questions for Kent or Zach, you can send the questions to me at fandorka, that's F-A-N-D-O-R-K-A, at solarpowerworldonline.com. And I will pass them along, and I know uh, both of them are very responsive and will get back to you uh, very promptly. Again, I'd like to thank Kent and Zach for their insights into the ABCs of utility scale solar inverters. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar from Solar Power World. This presentation will be emailed to everyone later today uh, or tomorrow, and will also be available at our website at www.solarpowerworld.com.